This is very exciting. I should actually say something because this may go out on the video live. And so I'll waffle on at the beginning that I am really happy to be talking for Moreland City Libraries. I appreciate the invitation and anything to uh, promote my ideas about why we need to learn from Indigenous cultures, not just about them, because they have so much to teach us about memory. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. And I'm just filling, because I don't want to start until 6.30 when people will be in. So if anyone wants to say anything, please do. If not, I shall go on about the fact that I love memorising and I used to hate it. And hopefully by the end of this talk, people will be inspired to try to memorise anything, even if they think they can't. So I'm not very good at filling. Um, and we've only got one more minute to go before I start talking officially. Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll tell you about my spider. I'm always wearing spiders. It's a book, a couple before these books that um, we're talking about tonight, spiders learning to love them because I used to be petrified of spiders, arachnophobe, out of control. And now I adore the creatures because I learned about them and they are the most incredible creatures. So uh, everywhere, oh, I would like that so everyone can see my beloved spider. I always wear one so I can talk about spiders not non-stop. So maybe I won't talk about memory stuff tonight. I'll just talk about spiders instead. But that's not the book I'm talking about. I'm talking about four other books, but mostly memory craft. Okay, it is 6.30. I'll have a sip and we'll start. I thank Heidi, who's controlling things from behind the scenes. But I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung on which um, Moreland City Libraries is located and acknowledge their elders past, present and future and emerging. I'd like to acknowledge the Jaja Wurrung whose land I'm, whose country I'm sitting on and worked on and who have helped me enormously with this research. But I'd like to extend that welcome to every Indigenous culture in the whole wide world because my research includes commonalities from all Indigenous cultures uh, on how they memorise vast amounts of information because we are all using the same brain. They haven't outsourced to writing technology and Google and store everything in memory. And by everything, I mean massive amounts. So just to introduce, I'm Dr Lynn Kelly. I started a PhD 12 years ago on animal behaviour and Indigenous stories and stuff, which was all nice and simple, until I realised that they were memorising vast amounts of information. I couldn't um, work out how. I can't memorise the day of the week, or couldn't back then, uh, because my natural memory is pathetically bad. I was only ever good at maths and physics and things because I didn't have to memorise anything. And they were memorising with animals, not only the mammals and big things we think about, but hundreds of invertebrates and fish and birds and all the rest. Hundreds, if not thousands of plants, all their properties and everything. Add in navigation, and we're talking hundreds of kilometres of navigation. We'll get to song lines and things in a moment. They, uh, genealogy, complex relationships, geology, science, weather, climate, land management, the list just goes on and on and on. And so I derailed my whole PhD and the planned book by asking how the hell are they doing this? And that's what happened and what I started researching. So what I found were a suite of methods that they put together. And what I'm going to talk about is how they can be used by you now rather than just how indigenous cultures use these because they had to memorize all that stuff and were dependent on it not only for survival physically but survival culturally and here in Australia we have cultures that we know date back uh, 65,000 years at least but we have stories that we know date back 17,000 years at least have been verified by science not that the indigenous people needed them verified but 
uh, stories of coastal changes. Now, I'm going to say lots of things really fast because I've only got half an hour or so to talk and then we've got questions. So for anything I say, if you want to know more about it, please put something in the comments and I'll come back to it at the end. But we have stories of research of Patrick Nunn on the go back and we have ways of knowing that those stories are valid recollections of events 17,000 years ago. Now I'm vaguely mentioned Stonehenge and that, that's a mere 5,000 years ago, yesterday. Uh, so we think that they will get stories going much further back as the research continues. But how do they do this? They use a suite of methods. One is story because story is much easier to remember than a list of facts. Secondly, stories can have novelty. Now I'm going to be talking about the neuroscience of the brain. It's as if indigenous cultures knew all the recent neuroscience and were applying it in their methods. So in the hippocampus, which is where it um, takes short-term memory to long-term memory, there are uh, cells called place cells. And the 2014 Nobel Prize for memory, uh, for memory, for medicine, talked about the way these place cells, location cells, aid memory. Without them, your brain is mapping things. And what is astounding to me is that every time you think of something, you lay down a physical neural. You really lay, your brain is putting a physical uh, neural network down. It'll disappear or get lost if you don't reinforce it um, by talking about it more, memorizing, checking, repeating. But those physical networks are there and we know that people can put down new neural pathways up until we've got evidence of people at 100 years old. The idea that the brain's plasticity necessarily decays with age has now been shown to not be true. Well, the trouble is we don't keep using it. So the things I'm saying match the neuroscience of indigenous brains, our brains, everyone's brains. So stories are much easier to memorize because the brain likes novelty and stories can be wildly novel. That's why indigenous stories, fairy tales, which arose from those, have vivid characters. They're all either very ugly, very um, beautiful. They're very good, they're very bad. They do horrendous, grotesque things because it's an unfortunate fact, which is useful for that when we start talking about how to apply these methods, your brain's much better at re remembering things that are grotesque or vulgar or sexual than it is nice, sweet facts. They use song because song works wonderfully for memory. And we know this is true now. There's a lot of studies on people with quite advanced dementia who play music that they have um, known from when they were young who are unresponsive and they will respond to the music and know every word of the songs. Now, indigenous cultures sing their information, sing their knowledge right through life. What we do is sing our alphabet when we're little and then we stop singing knowledge and we go on to I love you, I love you, I can't live without you and all that sort of stuff. So why aren't we singing information? There's an example that I've been testing this research over the last 12 years. Uh, an example at Malmesbury Primary School, we the kids ranging from prep to grade six, so up to 12 year olds, 70 kids, were done force because force is a fundamental part of the science curriculum. And a week later, I asked every student the same words exactly. Do you remember doing force in science? Yes, so I put in context, what is a force? Three told me it was a push or a pull. The rest told me either that it was when your parents or friends make you do stuff or may the force be with you, which might be great for um, Star Wars is lousy physics. So the music teacher, Joseph Bromley, took the Imperial March from Star Wars and put a little song together. A force is a pusher, a pull, push a pull. I can't not do the actions. Um, the kids sang the song in music, nothing for a week. I did exactly the same, same wording of the question. 70 out of 70 told me it was a push or a pull. They did the actions and they laughed. They added emotion and fun to it. And the brain science, neuroscience will tell you if you have an emotional content in what you're thinking about, it's much more memorable. 
So I'm not saying sing everything. I'm saying sing fundamentals because that meant originally when the students were, the teachers were saying the word force, the kids were thinking of all sorts of things. Now they always had force, push, pull. So music is one great way. And I said the actions, dance or movement is another way. If you've ever seen indigenous cultures acting out the behavior of animals, you'll see that they can do it in a way using dance and movement in a way that we never could using writing. Uh, so dance, narrative, song, and now we're going to get on to landscape and physical devices. So the academic research I was doing was on orality, O-R-A-L-I-T-Y. We have literacy, but what indigenous cultures have as well, if they've got literacy now, but before they had literacy was orality, an oral culture. They had this suite of methods, including song, narrative, dance, and so on, but also the landscape. <clears throat> it's not gin, I promise you. Or maybe it will be more fun by the end of the talk. So when I started working out how the hell they did it, I very soon came across song lines. Now, Aboriginal song lines are replicated all over the world uh, by Indigenous cultures. The Native Americans call them pilgrimage paths. The Inca called them sekas the Inca aren't around anymore, but C-E-Q-U-E-S, uh, the ceremonial roads of the Polynesians, um, and who else have I got? The Africans. They all use these same techniques. And basically what they do is as they move around the landscape, which is just the geography, they do some form of ritual at each location on that. And that that location becomes a sacred site, but becomes somewhere that is a cue to information. Now, if you go back to what I said about the 2014 uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine about place cells, the brain automatically does this. It makes a temporal snapshot. So if you think of something while you're at a location, you will associate the two together. We do that naturally what indigenous cultures do is do it deliberately. And that's something that has been introduced into schools too. I'll talk about that a lot more if people ask questions about that. So uh, your brain will automatically do that. So we can do that in our own rooms. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the other thing they do that I didn't emphasize enough in my earlier books on this topic was the use of characters. So let me go through how I went about this. I did PhD on, which became memory systems. And then I realized that indigenous cultures building ancient monuments must have used these systems. If you just make one assumption about the people who built Stonehenge and Easter Island and all the rest of oral cultures, is that they had vast amounts of knowledge and they wouldn't have survived if they didn't and that they were totally dependent on their memories, which we know they were. Add that in and suddenly there's a completely different way of looking at uh, these monuments like Stonehenge, the stone circles all over the world, um, Easter Island, Chaco Canyon, there's lots of them. And so that became my PhD. Uh, which then was published by Cambridge University Press as Knowledge and Power in Prehistoric Societies. Don't buy it, it's horrendously expensive and got lots of brackets and names and things in it, making it unreadable. But that was then published as The Memory Code by, published by Alan and Unwin here in Australia and other publishers over the world and been translated and stuff. I thought the big reaction would be, hey, new ideas about Stonehenge and all these monuments around the world. Um, what shocked me was probably 90% of the emails I got resulting from the memory code was how can we use this information about memory today? So that led to the next book, Memory Craft, which is what tonight's talk is mostly about and what I've been on about so far. But just come out is Songlines, um, The Power and the Promise, done with Mar Margot Neal. Um, the yeah, it's back to front indigenous head of indigenous knowledges at 
uh, National Museum of Australia, so it's Thames and Hudson and National Museum. So that's wonderful because it shows that Indigenous people are very happy about what I'm saying. But let's get back to you and your memory. So we've talked about characters. I was bringing in characters. I didn't emphasise that enough in Memory Code. I even don't know that I did in Memory Craft, but let's look at what some examples. I'm just getting some of my friends from over here. So I use characters for everything I learn because stories with characters in them make a lot of sense. Like, are easy to remember. And what was amazing to me and, and a bit distressing at the beginning was that the, a lot of those questions were about how to memorize language, foreign languages. Now, given my memory is so naturally bad, at school, foreign languages were nigh on impossible for me. So I decided eventually I had to take it on and test these methods for French, which I did. So these are my characters. This is Fleur and Petit Prof. You stop feeling stupid talking to bears and dolls and things very quickly. So Fleur is female. She's got a flower on her dress. Uh, Petit Prof is male. So for French, where the big problem is what's masculine and what's feminine, I, anything I think about that's like la robe is feminine, I associate with fleur. So in my stories and imagination, and sometimes I physically put them on. So in the mornings, when I get dressed, when I was learning all the clothes, I would put the dresses on fleur and the bra on petit prof. Now, petit prof wasn't terribly pleased about that, but the soutien gorge is masculine. So now you're never going to forget that bra is masculine in French. Vagina is as well, but um, Petit Prof's not terribly happy about me mentioning that. Because I started to cope with French, I decided let's go the full hog. And you can probably work out what language I also took on, which was Chinese, Mandarin um, dialect. And they helped me with that having characters that I talk to, and I talk to them all day in French or Chinese. Well, the Chinese ones don't get a lot of conversation. They get a lot of pointing and words. Um, makes a massive difference in the way you think because it brings it to life. It adds character. The other big one is song lines, memory palaces, Method of loci, you can call it anything you like. That's L-O-C-I, method of loci. The ancient Greeks, if you read anywhere about memory palaces and the ancient Greeks and method of loci, you'll find that the ancient Greeks invented it or discovered it or whatever. Um, this is the method by associating information with locations in the landscape. Once you've associated in information with the landscape, it becomes country. That's what country is. It's not just the geography, it's this landscape that's alive with knowledge and characters. Uh, the ancient Greeks didn't invent it. it. Every indigenous culture used this method. The ancient Greeks were the first to write it down and therefore get all the credit. So uh, if you want to set up, let's give an example. I have every country in the world, 242 of them memorized in order, population order. And then once, what a song line does is lo put the basic information down and then you can layer more and more and more complexity on top of it. So over there is the um, front door. Biggest country in the world is China. So at the front door, I imagine a Chinese de meal being delivered. That imagination, I actually go over and act it out. You only have to do it once. You feel so stupid, you don't forget it. Uh, the, that's associated the front door with China. Everything I want to add to it, Beijing, everything else, I add to the story I've got at the front door, which has already started because there's a meal being delivered. The second at the bookcase is India. I got down on the floor and watched a Bollywood production underneath. The third, which is rather upsetting, is the USA because I put Donald Trump at the table. So he's there permanently now, even when he disappears from politics, which is a bit sad. You go on right round, I go right round the house, the garden, down the street, get my shopping and come back. And I've covered every country in the world. I now have a hook for every single country. So for something on the news, something I read, 
I can add it in and layer it higher and higher. And that's what Indigenous cultures do. And the way they stop that information being corrupted, you know, the telephone game where you tell people and by the end of five minutes corrupted completely. And yet I just said that Indigenous cultures, Aboriginal, Australian, have um, stories dating back 17,000 years. How do they not get corrupted? And that's what secret business is all about, because by having initiation into the higher and higher levels, that's only ever repeated by people who've been initiated and have the permission and it's constantly checked that it's accurate. And so the higher levels you get, the um, more restricted it is. And that's one of the main reasons they can keep it going so long. The other is that these methods are so reliable. Okay, I've got 10 kilometers of memory palaces now set out around Castlemaine where I live. Uh, I've got memory palaces for French verbs, for Chinese radicals, if anyone out there has learnt to write in Chinese, for the radicals. Um, I've got tons of them, a thousand digits of pi are out there. I cannot believe how effective this is. And it works an absolute treat. And so my morning walks, this morning I did the French ER verb palace. Uh, on my morning walks, I'm playing around with information the whole time and it's fantastic fun so I have got to keep going I have got history starting at the front gate at um, four and a half thousand million years ago I walk right around through prehistory I used to walk with my dog she died of old age but she used to get to the Cretaceous and for some reason I think it was the dinosaurs or something she would not go through the Cretaceous I had to pick her up and carry her around until we got past the Cretaceous and almost the Holocene before she was happy to keep going. Then she trot on forever. No idea why. I get back to the front gate at 1000 BC. I can I then go right round the other block and get back here at 1900. And I've got every year mapped out here at home, which means no event can happen, nothing in any country or any date in time that I haven't got a hook for. My love of history has gone from zilch to can't get enough of the stuff because I can now hook it on. If I go, if you say 12,000 AD, my brain goes to the corner of Randall's Road over there. And I know that King John's on the, I don't have to remember the dates. I can look around and see there's a tree with King John on it. Great Zimbabwe and Africa's flourishing up the road. The Song Dynasty just finished in China. There's um, check what's going on at Chaco Canyon. I can see what's coming and what's been. It's amazingly effective. We know from the research that the Yanua people have 800 kilometers of song lines. My 10 kilometers is nothing. John Bradley from Monash University in his research with the Yanua people, they mapped 800 kilometers of these memory palaces all in memory of the elders. There are not many elders left that still have these skills, which is why I really emphasize we need to learn from Indigenous cultures, not just about, because they have skills and abilities we just don't have and are incredibly useful to us. So that's making what's called a temporal snapshot. Your brain, if you think about two things at once, a location and information, it says temporal, the same time, snapshot, it links them. It makes a photograph of them, sort of, a link. Uh, so there's all sorts of methods for using in Indigenous cultures way beyond just using your local environment. I'm not moving from here ever. Nothing will make me move because my landscape is absolutely alive. It's now country. I have glimpsed what song lines are, obviously. I haven't got that full experience I can't have. Can you imagine if you'd spent your whole life learning these song lines and you knew they came from your parents and your grandparents and back in all of time, and then someone invaded your country and put a fence across and shot you if you went there. It, what was done was not only physical abuse and cruelty, it was intellectual cruelty. The Native Americans moved off their land, called it the Walk of Tears when they were moved onto reservations. Most of my work's with the Pueblo people because they got to stay there. But 
let's keep going because um, one of the big things from the uh, memory code was I'd mentioned this device called a Lucasa, an African one. Let's look at one of the Australian equivalents. Most of them, like the Chiringa, are restricted items. But this is a Coolamon, a food carrying disc, dish. It's over 100 years old from Central Desert. I was given guardianship of it by Walpuri, uh, but it's not their culture, so the knowledge associated with it is lost. But And it would have been a girl's Coolamon. And on the back are all these markings. That is a memory device. So, and I'm using this for habitats and that. So the girls would learn a song associated with each of the marks and they would practice them and learn them and sing them and dance them uh, and slowly build up the knowledge and then layer more and more on top of it. The best uh, researched one that's thoroughly researched, unfortunately, there are no none of the elders left. The last one expert on this Lukasa, L-U-K, ASA from the Luba people in Africa, Western Central Africa, um, the Congo area. Uh, there's none left, although there were a couple of decades ago um, and the researchers did a lot of research on it. And I also um, paid Luba through the researchers for intellectual property. And this is the one I copy most. So basically it's a bit of wood with shells and beads put on. This isn't a real one. There's no real ones in Australia. This is copied from one I saw at the Brooklyn Museum in, in New York, who have two of them. Uh, and they use the back as well. And when I read that they said they have encoded um, the entire knowledge system, masses and masses and masses of information to these devices that hold beautifully, and you touch each thing and sing the song, tell the stories. I'm a foundation member of the Australian Skeptics. There was no way I was going to believe, despite all the research, that you could put a stack of information to a bit of wood with beads and shells on it. So I did some really sloppy science experiment. I grabbed a bit of wood from our veranda, randomly shoved on beads and, and shells, and decided after I designed it, it, this one is now designed for the information I wanted, but I, after I'd even whacked them on, decided to encode a field guide to the Victorian birds because I'm married to a fanatical birder. There are 412 native, give or take a few, depending on how they're classifying this day of the week, 82 families, so I encoded first the families onto this. So what I did, start with the first one, it's prickly because I'm really bad at craft and the uh, little bead fell off. But I left it off because the first one is Dromaeidae, which is the emu. And emus have very sharp bills, so it worked well anyway. And my songs start with drum, drum roll, I'm starting emu. The second, I promise you, I'm not doing a lot. The second shell is Anatidae, uh, Anatidae, which is the um, ducks, and I don't know if you can see the little speck on that, but if you look hard enough, it looks just like a waggling duck, duck tail. You've got to have a bit of imagination. You get more relaxed about this the more you do it. So now I've got to encode 16 ducks to that. They include the magpie goose and the swan. So I decided on a footy match between the magpies and the swans. There's the Australian, Australasian shoveler. So I figured it was got very violent, the hard head and the blue billed duck, so it got very violent. The shoveler buries them, the musk ducks off in the bush having, yes, off in the bush, uh, wearing his musk cologne. And so on, so to the two teals of the tea ladies. So I have a story that gives me the 16 ducks in order, in taxonomic order, so I know that the black duck and the mallard are similar and things like that. Um, and so I go on for every bird around. Things happen when you're doing this that makes it work easily. For example, I had to put Menuridae there at that little tiny one, Menuridae is our lyre bird. And I told you I was crap at craft. Oh, I'm not allowed to say that, very bad at craft. So you can see it dribbled the glue. I decided that looked like a man had urinated down my Lucasa, which gave me Menuridae, and he lied about it, which gives me lyre bird. So, 
that one was really easy. You will come up with something easily the way you let your memory relax. These are unbelievably effective. I've been doing this with kids as young as three, with little Lucasa doing all the acacias, the wattles for the area. Uh, I get more emails now about this from people who have done it and cannot believe how well it works than anything else. Now, there's a whole stack of other methods that I haven't got time to go into now, but memory boards like that, you can do just, that's the spider, because I'm into spiders, all the spider families, if I got that yeah, upside down, um, all the spider families, that's, that in, is Lycosidae, that's the wolf and the wolf spiders, and there's their eyes. Yeah. Um, that works, but it doesn't have the tactile nature of the Lycasa, so it doesn't work quite as well. You can use jewellery. These are all methods from Indigenous cultures. Jewellery, objects on a stage, and move them around. I'm doing Greek and Roman gods that way. It is unbelievably just stones, pretty coloured stones that I've found. The Inca Kipu, they ran an entire... Um, so the Aztec and the Maya at the same time were literate. They had their scripts. The Inca didn't. They ran their entire huge empire using the song lines around Cusco, their capital, and a knotted cord device called the Kipu. If you want to know any more about any of these, just ask in the comments, which I'm not looking at because I'll get confused. Uh, narrative scrolls of the Asian countries. You can use your body and hands. Um, all sorts of things that I'm not going into in depth because we haven't got time. Art is another big one. So my thing in education now is, let's get art and music into the heart of the curriculum, serving the whole curriculum as Indigenous cultures do, not on the side. Uh, one thing I've got is a suite of artworks. That's just one, six, eight, so 48 for the tables on how to do that using art. But this was very common in medieval times. There's a lot of lessons to learn from medieval times if you want to make sure you can remember what you're doing. Number one, do not type notes. Every page looks the same. It's not memorable. That's why medieval manuscripts were so elaborate and every you know capital letter was different and they left stuff at the side to write notes and people added on to these gorgeous manuscripts. So every page looked completely different. But two of the um, effort, two of the, the devices used in the medieval times that really rang true with me was a visual alphabet. I'm just, this is a little book I've produced. Um, hang on, more gin. Or water, whatever you want to believe. Um, where each letter of the alphabet is associated with something. So you're probably used to one sun, two shoe, three tree to give you a list. It's much more effective if you have them as something a little more active than apples and trees. Um, so I've got uh, the vulture who's, sorry, the image is back to front. The vulture who's um, going to attack the wombat who's also being attacked by Xena. Um, who's standing on a yak. Yak, where's the yak? Standing on a yak being attacked by Zeus. So that's my last few letters. And that continuous means that you can uh, see the story going through. And when I'm giving talks like I am now, I am actually going through each of these. I'm actually up to Xena. Uh, so I've associated each part of the speech with a different letter and go through. But my big problems with memorizing names. So I'm trying to work out what page to show you. But anyway, so for every pair of letters that comes up often in names, I've got an animal. So earwigs over here. So if I meet an earl, um, as in E-A-R-L, not a dukey one, somebody called earl, let's say ebony. Ebony um, I met at the local coffee shop. And I have to associate her with a piano, ebony and ivory. And so when she went off to get the coffee, in my imagination, she was going off to have a quick tinkle on the piano at the back. Every time I see ebony, I know her name's ebony. Um, that's the only EB. Sometimes you need to do more, like EL for elephant is going to give you Elizabeth and Eliza and a whole lot. So you need to do other bits too, mainly. 
but it works really well. And that's a medieval method um, called a bestiary. So their bestiaries were actually used, books of beasts. I ran out of beasts. There's some that you can't get um, beasts for this side, like IR, but um, I still managed to use things. And that works a treat. What I didn't realize when I made it was how valuable that would be for learning French and Chinese. I've now created one in French, which I can use very similarly for any French vocabulary. If I want to add something um, to something starting with LA, I will associate it with a rabbit, lapin. Uh, Chinese, it has to be implemented quite differently because of the structure of the language, but it works a treat. I don't know how I'd be managing Chinese without my my bestiary. So there's lots of things you can do. There's ways of memorizing numbers and dates. I entered the uh, memory competitions. Anyone who has read memory code, I said at the end that I couldn't enter the memory competitions, shuffling decks of cards and great strings of numbers because I wouldn't handle the stress. But I decided I had to. So I entered the memory competitions in 2018 and 19. There haven't been no, 2017 and 18, there hasn't been any since in Australia. So I'm the reigning senior champion. I even beat the Japanese senior champion once, although he's higher ranked than I am. So I can memorize shuffle decks of cards and lists of numbers and things. Uh, those techniques are around, they're not much use. Use it for more important things. But the thing is that no matter what your age, nor what your ability with memory is, you can always keep learning and you should never stop learning. So now I'm going to move my thing that I had over in the hope that there's some questions. Aha, uh -huh, I have to go back. I'm just learning how to use this. So uh, Barbara loves my spider. Thank you very much. Are the stars used in memory aid? What a Great question. Yes, um, indigenous cultures will use the landscape, the skyscape and the seascape. And I talk about that a lot in song lines, but I do in memory code, and memory craft too. Yes, the stars are used a lot. They form characters just as the ancient Greeks did. And, you know, we've got a what, Scorpio and all of those up there. But uh, often with indigenous cultures, they will use the dark spaces like the emu in a lot of um, Aboriginal cultures, and they will use groups of stars like Pleiades, Pleiades, I always say it wrongly, for the Seven Sisters, they'll use them as a group of characters. But yes, the stars are used by all cultures. They are used for navigation and the stories are associated that way, but not exclusively for navigation. Because if you look at, say, the Pacific navigators who navigate the whole ocean, if they were dependent on the stars, they can't navigate during the day, nor if it's overcast. So they always use a combination. And that's a really important point is that indigenous cultures integrate all these methods. So when I'm on my memory song lines, I'm making up stories of characters, I'm singing, I'm doing all sorts of things because whatever comes to mind and it happens very quickly. So how did indigenous cultures understand the song lines when there were so many languages? They would teach them to each other using symbols. A lot of the art is actually maps, um, but with knowledge built into it as well. Languages next to each other would overlap, but most indigenous people spoke five or six languages at least of all the ones around them. So they would be taught the next language but then they would be taught the songs and there's examples of songs traveling and ceremonies. A ceremony is basically a university lecture. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but they are singing knowledge. That's what song uh, ceremony is about. They will carry a message stick, which gives their identity and genealogy. And so they get permission to move across. So they're teaching to each other and they're learning the language. But song and dance, you can teach an awful lot using few words because they use all these methods linked together. So um, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. And I have only glimpsed this stuff. I'm not indigenous and um, I'm still learning every day. Uh, Natasha, memory is more receptive to the negative and grotesque. Is that a self-protectionist measure? I've never thought of that. 
Does this link to people who find it hard to heal from trauma? Hang on, I've got to see more. Could music and song and deliberate, deliberate reassociation aid in that? Also, is that a mother of pearl? Uh, yes, it is. It's a present from my husband for, uh, I've got to go that way, 50th birthday, and be, which was a long time ago, because um, of me and my love for spiders. So music, yes, it's interesting you ask about, I haven't thought of half these things, now I'm going to sit and think about them forever more. Uh, people who find it hard to heal from trauma possibly are memorising a lot more. And yes, the grotesque in that is hard to get out of your head, except for some people like me. Some of us, about 2% of the population, have a thing called aphantasia. We don't see visual images. So if I close my eyes and think of an apple, I see grey much. I see nothing. It's very hard to describe when I talk about images and stories and the way I make them, that I've got a concept more than I can actually see anything. So I have, I can't picture my parents' faces. Um, my husband says there's no point taking me anywhere because I won't remember it. Um, it. One of the positives that they think from the research on aphantasia is that we don't suffer from post-traumatic stress because we can't reenact events. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages. And music and song, I'm wondering, one thing with Indigenous cultures, this is a really interesting question, I'd need a lot more time to think about and talk to um, Indigenous cultures about it. But um, Indigenous cultures, the knowledge is not fixed. It's adapted constantly with new knowledge. But Margot, who wrote song lines with me, Margot Neal, uh, talks about Indigenous songs like the skeleton of the body, but each time it's performed, the flesh is different. And I wonder if you could change that memory by changing the music and changing the song. Um, it's a really interesting question, one that I'm going to have to think about a lot. Wish I could answer it. Uh, do try those. How does the narrative approach work for memorising numbers? Thanks, Kate. Um, Right, what you have to do is numbers are boring. I mean, I love maths, maths is my great thing, but the number itself is dull. So what you do is create a character for each one. So I'm at the sort of simplest level with um, the memory champions, but I do this for dates as well. So for the first 99 numbers, well, 100, 0, 0 as well, I have a character associated with each. So I change them to initials and then find a character. So zero, zero is O, O. Um, I couldn't find anyone with initials, Ozzy Osman, but he doesn't mean anything to me, but Mike Oldfield, I really love, and he's old. So I called him Old Oldfield. So every time I want zero, zero, my story includes Mike Oldfield. Um, and so it goes on through them all. I'm trying to think one four is JA, so it's Jane Austen. So if I want to remember the date 1400, I have Jane Austen and um, my Goldfield. I have to combine them. But what you do is you give each person, each character, the character themselves, an action and an object. So my Goldfield plays music on tubular bells. So if it's 1400, I've got Jane Austen. And the second thing, what does Mike Oldfield do? He plays music. So now I've got Jane Austen playing music. And at the 1400 date, I've got Jane Austen sitting there playing music. If it's the other way around, if I wanted for some reason 0014, I've now got Mike Oldfield wearing one of those gorgeous dresses, you know, the little high busted dresses that Jane Austen did. Um, because I couldn't have her writing books because I've got a different author. But what you do then is once you've got those 99 in, you use them over and over and over. And it's wonderfully fun to come up with these stories. And it starts to happen very naturally. One bit of warning, do not use anybody you love dearly. Like I originally had my granddaughters in and suddenly I had them being thumped by um, Lionel Rose and being, you know, beheaded by somebody. So I ditched them. I can behead Jane Austen, but I can't behead my granddaughters. So 
is my memory better in general now? Very perceptive question. No, my memory is still as bad as it always was naturally, but I have these techniques at my fingertips all the time. So the moment I meet a new person, let's say I meet Hillary, I have to associate Hillary with a hippopotamus. Now, I don't say Hillary is a hippopotamus. That's not a good idea. I have to associate her with it and they swim. So I think of this person as swimming in Africa or whatever. But most often, the trouble with remembering names is that you go straight into the conversation and you've forgotten to do anything with the name. So I stop the conversation before it starts and say, I really want to remember your name, which they take as a compliment. Um, I have this system. I've got to associate you with a hippopotamus. I don't say you are a hippopotamus. I have to associate. And usually they will say something back. They'll laugh. They'll tell me that they saw a hippopotamus or, oh, do you think I'm fat? No, that's why it's hard. Whatever you do then becomes memorable because you've had a reaction. Then you go on with the conversation. It works a treat and you've got names in place. Uh, I need to get through these. They're wonderful questions. My fight, ah, another very good question. Thank you, Jennifer. The front door is China. It's also zero zero. Well, it's actually zero one, which is OJ Simpson. Uh, yes, you can stack as many as you want. I'm told five's about as many as you should stack at a location. Um, I five's my maximum. So at location five, I have um, Brazil. I also have boron because I've got the periodic table in there. But when I've got Brazil, I've got a complete carnival happening out there. And a little guy steps out and says, eh, careful, Rio's not the capital of Brazil, it's, it's Brasilia. And so I want to put boron in there as well. So I dressed him in a gray suit and there's all this colorful carnival and this boring man is stepping out and telling me, this isn't the capital, that's Brasilia. You can, and you start stacking. I've also got zero five, which is Oliver Sacks at the same place. Um, so yes, you can stack them once you've got your memory palace in place. I'd suggest five locations in a room and then go to the next room, the next room, around the garden, down the street. Each house as, or laneway or shop down the street is associated with one country, one number. So yes, you can use it for many countries. Uh, and the animal class in the list of animals. Yes, um, my list of animals, I don't do that way. I've got them on the stone wall. So I wanted to test stones because I talked about stone, um, stone circles and things. Stones are wonderful because if you look at a stone, the more you look at it, you will see whatever you want. If you're thinking elephant and look at the stone, you will see an elephant like clouds and things. It's that word I can never pronounce, paradidolia or something. Sorry, apologies. Uh, but uh, so yes, that works really well. You could put the animals classification in. Uh, indigenous cultures associate animals with locations and with birth, and then you get totem, you get all sorts of things. They're mixing it all together, but in their brains, they will extract whatever they want. And St. Augustine talked about this because um, he used these methods, Cicero, and they wrote down about how they used it. Homer, if you analyze the Odyssey and the Iliad, it matches exactly a, a sung line type structure. Um, St. Augustine talked about getting to a location in the palace and everything wanting to jump out at you at once. And you have to say no, no, and just select what you want. It's interesting when I walk down the street, sometimes I don't want to think about history and numbers and characters and everything. And I just say, shut up, I just want to walk. And mostly they will, except St. Augustine. He jumps out from a lamppost down the street every single time. But that's St. Augustine. Um, so yes, you can stack everything. And is that all the questions we have? Um, if there's any, I hope I haven't missed any. But uh, Moreland Library has recommended the following titles, but mostly I've been talking about memory craft. I will do a very quick Stonehenge um, because uh, it really just is totally logical because Stonehenge originally, this is memory code I'm talking about, 
Stone Age originally was a big circle of stones. The big guys, these sarsens, didn't come for 500 years. It was originally a circle of stones, uh, the blue stones. So if you look at that photo, it was these little guys were out in a big wide circle and then they were moved in when they brought in these things 500 years later. So if you imagine a song lines that cover hundreds of kilometers and they're now starting to settle, they can't afford to lose that information. So the obvious thing to do is replicate the song line locations locally. A hundred stones in a circle, the ditches around hinges are all flat bottomed and no, there's no theory that explains why. But if you think in terms of performance, and the archaeologists that have excavated them talk about how deliberately flat they were. That's where you can perform. And can you imagine in a ditch up to 10 metres deep, if we're talking Darrington walls, I won't go into all the archaeology because there's lots of it, um, in white chalk. So it's going to echo and reverberate like a bathroom. You're singing away. You've got torches which will reflect off the light. It must have been extraordinary. And I've asked my husband to dig me a hinge ditch, but he won't. But such is life. So uh, you can then find in all these um, situations, there are a thousand stone circles around um, England and Western Europe, varying from very big flashy ones. Stonehenge is nowhere near the biggest. There's Avebury and Durrington Walls and, and others. Um, but to little ones, so you're looking at universities and schools and the local information, they're all aligned on um, the solstices because you must run a calendar for ceremony because if you don't perform the ceremonies, the information's lost, but also for agriculture. There's, there's 10 different um, criteria I've got for these things. And then you've got the same in timber circles in the US, which are the same dimensions. They weren't, I mean, they're thousands of years apart, but weren't communicating. That's what works for the human brain. They use timber because they didn't have stone. You've got the same thing in Egypt and South America, everywhere, Africa, because, and Asia, because these things work. So that's what um, my archaeology theory but is all about. But what I'm focusing on now is the memory techniques. So I think we've finished with questions unless I have missed something. Uh, so I'm really delighted that you were here. Um, thank you to Heidi for inviting me and who's behind the scenes. And on her behalf, I'm now saying goodbye. And it's been lovely being here with the Moreland City Libraries. And thank you for the wonderful questions. Bye. <laughs>